Well, <clears throat> First Peter, we've titled this series as we're studying through the Bible on Sunday mornings, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We're looking at First Peter in the context of holy living. And this is kind of where, you know, the, the direction that Peter is taking us, thinking about as we are holy. We were called, we saw in chapter 2 that we were called a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of God's own possession. And so the idea of holy being, you know, set aside for a purpose, something sacred. <clears throat> and that's you. You may not feel like it, but that's you. And you're called, as the scriptures have told us, to, actually it was, the, it was a pretty powerful call. It was back in chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 15. Be like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. And so that there is this outflow. The, the life that we live is in response to the gospel. You know, we hear it all the time around here. We're responding to the gospel. We're living in freedom and we're growing in grace. But it starts first with the response to the gospel. Who God is <clears throat> and what he has done. And so the, the life that we live, it is a reflection of our creator. It's the idea that we are image bearers of God. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. It's Genesis chapter 1 on the second day of creation. It says, Genesis 1, 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. <clears throat> and we saw that as we live this life, it looks like uh, Jesus. Look back at chapter 2, verse 21, where it said, You have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And there was this example in, in lesson last week about this idea of in his suffering. But really, Jesus is the example. And so as we respond to God, and we're reflecting our creator, and we are you know, following Jesus, the way that we live will look different than the world. And that's the point, and that's, that's what Peter is teaching us. This is what God's word is, is showing us. And remember, Peter has said this a couple times now up to this point, that, that we are just sojourners on this earth. We're, we're foreigners in a foreign land, passing through. You know, our true citizenship is in heaven and it's rooted in eternity. And so that is going to give us a different perspective on life. Think about it. if you ever do any hiking around here, you know, typical hike around here, if you go up, like, say, the Mountain Loop Highway, uh, you, you got to go through a long journey through the woods first, right? <laughs> and then you get through the woods and you normally come to a mountaintop view. And the views are incredible. And it's like you then see the lay of the land and you know which way north is. That's what having our citizenship rooted in heaven with this rooted in eternity, that's north. That that's gives us the view of the land and how we see things and we know where to go. To live with an eternal perspective. It's a heavenly eternal perspective. So he says... Uh, in verse 11, you remember chapter 2, verse 11 from our last time together, he said, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. And so he went into this whole thing about what it means to walk in excellence. And it started off with this abstaining from the lusts that we identified wage wars against our soul. It included the way that we treat those around us. It included the way how we handled our freedom. This is chapter 2, verse 16. It says, act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covenant for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. And so as we act as free men, this included in walking in excellence, how we handled authority in our lives. God, the government our employers, included how we handle our suffering. This is uh, you know, the end of verse 20, but if, if, so chapter two, verse 20, if when you do what is right and you suffer for it, you patiently endure it, it finds favor with God. 
And so, continue walking in excellence. Chapter 3. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on desired dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being, without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. To sum it up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, To love and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ear attend to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for... The opportunity to gather this morning, to open up your word, to hear from you. We thank you for the freedom that comes from your grace. We pray now, Lord, as we purpose ourselves to the reading and the hearing of your word, that you would speak to us individually, and that you would speak to us corporately as a church. Lord, I pray for healing. God, I know that there are those in our community that need healing. And God, you're the healer. Lord, I know you heal emotionally and physically. We ask by your spirit, through the power of Jesus' name, that you do that. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. I love what he said in verse 9. At the very end, you were called for this purpose that you might inherit a blessing. You're purpose built. You you are purpose built. Custom made. Uh, There's kind of a thing in the, I'm sure it's in in all hobbies, but my particular hobby is kind of in the Jeep world there. And uh, we, we like to brag that we built the Jeep. We didn't buy it. And it's, and you build your, your, your Jeep for a purpose. And my particular Jeep is built to go on rocks. I purpose built it to go on rocks. God has purpose built you. You are custom made to live like this, to to live out what he has instructed us. You have been designed and created to be like Jesus. It's in your very name, Christian, to to be Christ-like. And we're called to be Christ-like in every area of our lives. We don't clock in or clock out of being a Christian. (laughs) I hope you don't do that. (laughs) You don't clock in at church. Okay, I'm a Christian now. And you clock out when you leave. No. We're on call 24-7. This is it. We're here. We're Christian. And we don't follow Jesus for man's approval either. Paul writes this in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. says that whatever you do... You do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ in whom you serve. And so to follow Jesus is to take a different path. Your life is going to take a different path when you follow Christ. It's going to look different than those who are around you. And one area that's going to be different is this idea of submission in the marriage. And we, you know, he clarified at the beginning of the whole talk, this is kind of this you know, 
big overarching theme, this idea of submission here. It, he started it in, in verse, chapter 2, verse 13, and he said it was for the Lord's sake. When we unpack that word to submit in our last time together, we saw that in the original Greek it was a two-part word, hupo tasso, right? And we saw that it was to arrange under. It's a military term, and it literally means to be under rank. And the idea of it's, it's how armies are arranged, and you have all the different, you know, positions, that are titles, I guess you'd call them, generals, colonels, majors, captains, privates, you know, you have sort of this order. And I like it. one commentator, he writes, this is Wearsby. He says, a private can be smarter or more talented and a better person than the general, but they're still under rank to the general. And they are submitted to the general, not so much the person, but it's the position. And we looked at last time, when we looked at this idea, it doesn't have anything to do with value or ability. It has everything to do with God-appointed order and authority. And Wearsby writes, he says, if you don't want to be under rank, it's called mutiny. And... The Christian's not called to mutiny. That's not what we're called to. We're called to follow Christ. And the example that he gives, he gives the example of submission. He went to the cross. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He laid aside his rights so that we could be saved. And so Peter says here at the beginning of chapter 3, verse 1, in the same way, so in this vein, in this context here, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any one of them is disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Wives are to come under the authority of their husbands. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with value or ability. That's not what we're talking about. As we all, husbands all know that our wives are very valuable and are very capable. I was thinking about, uh, we did a wedding yesterday with uh, Nolan and Caitlin, and they, they wish they were here, but they, I, they'll be fine with it. Um, <laughs> in their premarital counseling, and I'm, no, I'm sure they're not tuning in, they're on their honeymoon, they're not watching this, uh, <laughs> they told their story, and it was a really cool story, and what was kind of funny is they, before they started dating, they like vetted one another that they were on fire for Jesus. They didn't want to mess around. They didn't want to date if the other one wasn't on fire for Jesus. That's key, isn't it? Because if you're going to fall under the, the, the Bible's model of submission and marriage, you better make sure that the one you're marrying is going to be on fire for Jesus. And so I was going to tell all the, the ladies that are, you know, the young gals that are dating, make sure that you can follow the guy that you're dating. Can you come under his authority? Can you come under his leadership? Can you follow him? What's important to understand is that the same goes as the other areas of submission. It's to God first and then human institutions. I like how uh, Ephesians says it this way. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And so we may ask, well, what is everything? Well, what is, first of all, in that passage, it says, as the church is subject to Christ, Jesus would never require the church to do something immoral, unethical. Jesus would never abuse the church. And so wives are not expected to go along with an illegal, immoral, unethical behaviors or abuse. No way. It's not what it's about. And notice, too, that when he says here, he says, your own husband. It's not this blanket thing. The wives are coming to the authority of their husband. We talked about this last week, about this idea of, of making sure that we submit to God's authority and God's word before man's. And it, we talked about how Peter, in Acts, when they were told to not follow God's word and not preach Jesus, and he just simply said, we have to obey God rather than man. So there comes the guidelines. And so as you wives, and you follow your husbands, it's going to be 
this demonstration, it's, it's actually going to preach something. It's going to be a demonstration of your Christian obedience and honoring the patterns of creation and the model of, of church, the church in Christ, and it becomes a witness, right? He says here, middle of verse 1, even if they're disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by your behavior. And Peter addresses this interesting cultural issue that I think is, is relevant today as well. What if two people get married, say they're non-Christians. They get married, and then one of them, say the wife, gets saved. Does she have to submit and follow under the authority of her husband? And he's saying, you could win your husband. You could win your husband by coming under his leadership and following here. It's pretty awesome. Maybe one without a word. This can be powerful. Now, I want to recognize that it is also very difficult to be in a marriage with one person, a Christian, and one not. It is a super hard thing. And I've had lots of conversations with people in that category, and it is a, a very difficult thing. But don't give up. Be encouraged. God knows your situation. And God hears your prayers. And, and I would just encourage you to maybe have a good community around you to flex that muscle of prayer. And listen, coming under the authority and following along here is going to have better traction than nagging. It just, it will. You're going to get better, a better result. And so, good encouragement there. Peter goes on here to encourage the gals to not merely focus on the outward appearance, but the inward character. You see that in verse 3? says, Your adornment must not be merely external, wearing hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Character matters more than beauty. I know that's not what our culture values, but that's what God values. Character over beauty. You know, it's interesting that we read in in 1 Samuel when Samuel is sent, God sent Samuel to to go find the next king of Israel. And he was told to go to Jesse's house in Bethlehem. And it's interesting that happens there. I want you to see this. This is 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. I think we have this with David. Yeah. When they entered... He looked at Eliab, so Jesse brought his, his firstborn son to Samuel, thinking, this is it. And the Lord said to Samuel, oh, he said, Samuel said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So obviously this was a handsome fellow, tall, good stature. Samuel's like, this is it. This is the next king. Check this guy out. And God's like, no, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at the heart. Proverbs 31, talking about an excellent wife. I quoted this at the wedding yesterday. Proverbs 31, 10, an excellent wife. Who can find for her worth is far above jewels. And then the whole rest of that chapter goes on to describe what an excellent wife is. And it comes to a conclusionary statement. This is Proverbs 31, verse 30. He says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. There's not necessarily anything wrong with charm, but it can be deceptive. It can be misleading. And, and beauty is not evil, but it fades. I looked at the mirror the other day. I'm like, dude, you're getting old. <laughs> what happened? It happens. Beauty fades. These are external things, right? So he's saying what's inside, that's what matters. Your character is what is imperishable. That's the thing that lasts. Verse 4, let it be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And so if we consider how much effort that we put in as a society to the beautification process, I don't know how much time you took to get ready today, but 
Looks like some of you less than others, but... Um, <laughs> If you think about the time you put into that, what about your character? Let's make sure that we're investing in our character, right? Because this is what matters. This is what lasts. You husbands, verse 7, in the same way. So he's talking about this focus of character, this broad subject of submission, Living, walking in excellence, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone who's weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Ephesians talks about a mutual submission in the body of Christ and in the marriage. This is Ephesians 5.21. It's right before the whole uh, husbands and wives talk. And it says, says, to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And so there is this God-appointed order of authority, but there is also mutual submission in that. You know, in that whole, we, we already quoted it, but it was, uh, that maybe I, I don't know if I quote it or not, but in Ephesians 5, it, it talks about that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And so if we consider, how did Christ love the church? What did he do? He died for the church. He laid aside his comforts for the good of his bride. He laid aside his comforts for the good of his bride. To live with your wife in an understanding way will require husbands to lay aside your comforts to know your bride, to understand, to know. I don't know if you heard about the guy in Southern California. He was walking along the beach, and he found the, the lamp, like one of those oil, old oil lamps. And he got excited, and he checked out, he started rubbing it, and the genie pops out. Did you hear about that guy? It was in the news. <laughs> genie pops out, and he's like, this is it, man. I got it. I, I hit the lottery. And, and the genie's like, one wish. He's like, what, what happened to three? He's like, inflation, one wish. So he's like, all right. He thought about it for a bit, and then he said, you know what? I always want to go to Hawaii, but I get seasick, and I can't fly. I'd love a bridge to Hawaii. And Jeannie's like, you're crazy. The infrastructure, the concrete, the rebar, the supply chain issues. Don't forget about the inflation. Pick something else. The guy's like, gee, it's okay. So he thought about it for a bit, and he's like, okay, listen, I got it. I've been married 30 years. And my wife says, I don't get it. And I don't always understand. And I'm insensitive. And I would like to have full knowledge of my wife. I want to I wanna know what she's thinking. And when she says nothing, I want to know what that really means. When she's crying, I want to know her, her in, in emotional state at that point. And that genie says, do you want that bridge two lanes or four? To understand your wife, this is going to take intentionality. It's not going to come natural. It's not going to come from a genie in the bottle. This word, to understand, is gano in the original Greek. It's to know and recognize. Do you know your wife? Do you know her likes and her dislikes? Do you know her pain and her struggles? Do you know her fears? What, what brings her joy? Don't let familiarity cloud your understanding. Your wife will change over time. We've been married 22 years, been together 23. Yeah, her core personality is the same, but lots has changed. Her struggles, her desires have changed over the years. This is gonna require husbands to listen, to spend time, to ask questions. Another thing I always do in premarital counseling, we talk about love languages. You know, there's, if you ever do this, it's kind of fun. There's a thing called five love languages, and you can, with Gary Chapman, I think that's his name, uh, you can go online, you can take this little quiz, and, and it'll kind of come up with, like, your top two love languages. But what's interesting is there's different dialects to that love language. And so 
I'll hear, I'll talk to a young couple and I'll say, so love language. And it's like, it says quality time. And so often for the guy, quality time is just sitting on the couch watching a movie. But for the gal, it's face to face quality time. No, no TV, right? And so get to know her. You need to ask questions. To recognize is to acknowledge her. It's to see and acknowledge her. Are you aware of changes she's made? Let her know. Let her know you notice things. This is not easy, nor does it come natural for the male species. So wives, have patience, please. But husbands, look up, look around. Did she get a haircut? Did she get a new outfit? Acknowledge it. Live with your wife in an understanding way. We're called to cover and protect our wives. God has given men certain strengths. And I love how as a husband and wife come together, they have different strengths, different weaknesses, and they can cover each other. And the men are supposed to cover their wives so they feel protected and covered. So if the call to action for the wives was to submit to their own husband, the call to action for the husbands here is to honor, to show honor. You see that end of verse seven? Honor her as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Do you see her for who she truly is, the daughter of a king, a fellow heir, of the kingdom of heaven, beautifully and wonderfully made in the image of the creator. And when you treat your wife in this way, your prayers won't be hindered. Their failure to treat your wives in this honorable way, there is a, a, a spiritual consequence. To sum it up, verse eight, wrap all this up. He says, all of you. So to the citizen, to the servant, to the employee, to the wife, to the husband, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. What would happen if we would Chapter 2, verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. What would happen if we didn't do tit for tat, blow for blow? Here's something I often ask in marriage counseling. Do you keep score? Do you keep records of wrongdoing to be able to pull out just at the right time to make a power play? It's no good. That, that's not the model that Jesus gave. That's not the example that Jesus gave us. In fact, Jesus says uh, on a Sermon of the Beatitudes, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So if this is how we're to treat our enemy, how much more our brother and sister in Christ and how much more our spouse? not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. At the end of that whole uh, marriage instruction, Ephesians chapter five, he, he says that the, the husband must love his wife and, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And there's this whole thing, love and respect, and there's a, a book out there called Love and Respect, and I think it's a wonderful book. And in that material, in that book, he talks about this crazy cycle that couples sometimes get into. She doesn't respect me, so I don't love her. She, he, he doesn't love me, so I don't respect him. And it goes round and around and around, and someone's got to stop it. Someone's got to stop it. This is how you do it. Harmonious, sympathetic, kind-hearted, humble, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, giving a blessing. If you 
to approach your relationships with a humble spirit, you will receive a blessing. He says, verse 10, for the one who desires to love and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Man, that's a word for today, isn't it? I was thinking about this. uh, Seeking peace and pursuing it. These are action words. Seek and pursue. It's like, go after it. What is it going to take to be a, a peacemaker? You know, Jesus talked about being a peacemaker. What is it going to take to be a peacemaker in your relationships? And, and then we, we wrestle with these ideas of, okay, so what if we disagree? Um, you know, we have to ask the Lord's help to work through that disagreement. What is that disagreement rooted in? Is it something of God's word? Or is it something in our flesh? And then we can bring that to the Lord and ask him to help. And what does it look like to, to, to be this walking in excellence, but also holding up God's word? There's a tension there, right? So seeking peace and pursue it. I love that. I'm going to end with just verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? For what is good? I think about the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians. He said there's no law against that. You can can do the fruits of the Spirit as much as you want. And that, in fact, that's uh, Galatians 5. You can turn there if you want. It's... Galatians 5.22 it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. He said, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And, and so you see, this is what it's going to take. In the context of marriage, you need to crucify your flesh. If you think about any Argument. I mean, 99% of the arguments are rooted in your selfish desire. And if you were to see that, recognize it for what it is, it would help you then to crucify that and to be able to seek peace and pursue it. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word. Challenging word, God. Lord, this is something that, if accomplished, it needs to be done in the spirit. And we need your help with it, God. So would you help us in this area? Lord, would you help us in in marriages? Lord, I pray for the single ones that are dating or that want to date. Lord, that they would know and understand what they need to look for. I pray for healing in marriages. God, I know that there are marriages that have tough time and there needs to be healing. We pray for healing in that. Lord, we know you can do that. Pray for breakthroughs and blessings, God. Lord, we know the enemy attacks our marriages because it's a representative of you and and us, Christ and his bride, the church. Lord, give us strength in these areas. Pray that we could, by your spirit, walk in excellence. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday.